Hello, thanks for tuning in. My name is Aki Arvinen, and in this video I'll give you an introduction to immersive audience journey. So this is research that we at Digital Catapult have conducted on behalf of UKRI as part of the Audience of the Future demonstrator program. This talk is about how audiences perceive your immersive productions and, and also how uh, they come out of them with certain interpretations. And it's also about how your audience might completely disregard your immersive component in your production if what they there came there for was the artist associated with the production. It's also about how audiences might come to your, let's say, VR pop-up theater and you think uh, they associate uh, the experience with going to an art house cinema, but actually they come out saying uh, that it was closer to an amusement fair uh, or park visit in their minds. It's also about how community building is important and how if you uh, do not pay attention to community building and building anticipation for your production from early on in the production, you just might miss a trick. Okay, let's get on with the show. So you might be familiar with the demonstrators. There's four of them. Uh, one uh, focused around the moving image, uh, one uh, around the visitor experience, one around performance, and one around sports. The original need for this research uh, emerged from the question of audience. So when the demonstrators started working on these productions, there was an insight, or really lack of insight, regarding what is immersive audience, or what are immersive audiences. Okay, I've sat down <laughs> to begin this journey. So let's first talk about immersive uh, as a term. So um, one of the things that uh, we found throughout this research was that, from an audience point of view, Immersive is a very broad umbrella term, and whereas we who work with immersive technologies often tend to associate immersive with a certain uh, technology, let's say augmented reality or virtual reality, but the audiences who attend experiences like this uh, tend to think about any uh, experience where they feel stepping into an alternative reality that has been kind of artificially created for them and, and that reality somehow responds to them. So that's kind of like the scope of the no notion of immersive in, in most uh, audience members' heads. And, and therefore, when we talk about the immersive audience journey here, we try to capture everything in that scope. But on the other hand, of course, that's why we are also in the context of immersive technologies is that they are particularly good at creating these kind of experiences. So whether we talk about virtual reality, augmented reality, but also projection technologies in location-based uh, physical sets and, and, and so on and so forth, or, or even purely audio-based uh, binaural or spatial audio uh, leveraging uh, applications. So immersive is many things, but still uh, that's one of the reasons that we adopted this also quite a sort of a high level uh, customer journey map approach. So because I think that enables us to talk about the common things and not just the specific things to the technology. And therefore this customer journey map approach, which is quite broadly used in marketing and also like service and design thinking contexts, uh, we first thought that maybe that's um, quite self-evident, but experience has shown that because many of the practitioners, producers in the immersive uh, space, in the cultural space at least, uh, tend to come from design, creative, artistic context, they are not necessarily familiar with the approach and uh, they tend to be very much focused on the creative process rather than the more holistic process around it. Uh, and therefore, the customer journey map approach lends itself to applying to this kind of a 
process where we think about okay not only what happens with the audiences while they're experiencing our production but before they come to it and after they leave it and so we found some validation also from what has been studied in uh, connection to arts audiences so in particular uh, there is one piece of research called arc of engagement this is a commissioned piece of research for the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And uh, there the authors established this idea of an arc of engagement. And it's quite similar to the customer journey map approach in the sense that, again, it tries to talk about the sort of contextualization of the experience by build up and preparation for the actual kind of artistic exchange that happens while the audience actually experiences the work and then there is this more reflective post-processing part and Kalaka as they call it impact echo that also contributes to the meaning making that happens after the fact so to speak and if artists and commissioners distributors anybody who is in a position to set up an immersive production for an audience out there if they are able to leverage this more holistic approach again we think that that is first of all contributes to a more structured planning of the project and just puts the project in a better place to succeed because the kind of old approach you could say of just build it and they will come just doesn't really cut it uh, there's so much competition so, so many things grabbing our attention and uh, especially uh, now uh, we are recording this still when the COVID-19 pandemic is still very much a thing. Uh, while that puts a lot of uncertainty to, for instance, location-based uh, immersive productions and their future, we believe that tools like the audience journey are even more useful now to try to capture and try to manage that uncertainty. And, and create sort of alternative approaches um, for distributing your work and all that goes into it. So therefore, while the research itself was conducted before the pandemic, uh, we like to think that it's even more crucial now when many immersive studios are, if not struggling, then at least, you know, challenged with lots of uncertainty. So, as a definition for the customer journey map, uh, here's one definition from service design literature, which says that as a human-centered tool, journey maps not only include steps where a customer is interacting with a company, but reveal all the key steps of the experience. So this also speaks for the applicability of this tool for creative purposes of, of just trying to map out all the possible scenarios where the user, the audience member might end up at. I'll continue to quote, journey maps help us to find gaps in customer experiences and explore potential solutions. So that's what I just uh, referred to. And finally, they can be used to visualize ex existing services as well as potential future experiences. So this also speaks for the advantage of this approach as a communication tool. So in a team that is working on a production, in my experience, having worked in game design and development, communication is just key to keep the theme aligned and keep things on schedule and, and, and all that. And therefore, having this kind of an overview with all, also different responsibilities and stakeholders mapped into it, that who you know comes into play at what part of the production in this more holistic way, uh, a visualization of it as the customer journey map or the immersive audience journey, as we would like to call it in this context, is very useful. When we first set out to answer the question that, okay, what is immersive audience uh, in the demonstrative program context, it seemed quite overwhelming. Now, they really, isn't an immersive audience that it would be kind of like a homogeneous uh, cohort out there. What we are finding is that immersive audience is 
uh, a collection of subsets of audiences. So ranging from festival goers who happen uh, across a immersive production exhibited in that festival, uh, whether it's online or, or location-based out there. Uh, immersive audiences include gamers who are into VR and, and so on and so forth. They include casual AR, mobile AR uh, audiences, but also then more niche, but actually uh, those audience cohorts that might be more profitable and engaged like secret cinema enthusiasts, immersive theater enthusiasts, even VR uh, documentary enthusiasts. And yeah, the key thing really to understand is that the context uh, defines the audience for any given production. So for instance, where, if it's location-based thing, where is it uh, delivered? Uh, exhibited, uh, but also on digital platforms, uh, the device might uh, dictate and shape your audience, but also social dynamics. Uh, so is it something that enables for friends and families to go together? This is of course something that we will see how uh, things play out after uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, but anyhow, there are already, we are seeing some clever solutions in that space of how to facilitate, for instance, a family or a household uh, come in at a time to a location-based solution. All right, now I will move on to a few observations per phase uh, in the next 10 minutes, um, and that will basically wrap up the talk. So um, let's first talk about awareness. So this is the phase where a potential audience member becomes aware that an immersive production exists. And now this, of course, relates quite heavily with promotion, uh, uh, marketing, but also community building, as we will come to learn in a minute. And, and the key takeaway, I think, from this phase is that immersive productions are challenging to market by traditional means. So at the same time as we are living, you could say on a sort of age of peak TV, for instance, if you think about all the streaming television format content that is out there, and especially in the, in the realm of storytelling. And, uh, and I think this thing has just accelerated uh, during the pandemic lockdown and so on. Uh, so, for instance, framing your experience as the peak in storytelling in the immersive front is not necessarily the, the most sort of strategically uh, sound um, choice. You might prove me, prove me wrong <laughs> going forward. But anyhow, uh, the point I'm making is that if you try to steer away from that, then you need to emphasize the unique uh, component of your immersive experience. And that tends to be that immersion, whether it's uh, the sense of presence that you feel through, let's say, VR or the physical set uh, with projections and props and all that kind of stuff that you're aiming to build. However, uh, the, the paradox here is that then what you would want to do in, in creating that awareness for the audience is to communicate that unique uh, aspect of the experience. And that just isn't very easy to do with traditional marketing means. So if you think about print materials or even video materials, uh, you want to try to communicate what it is, uh, how do people actually experience uh, the production. So uh, you need to be creative there. And, in, and, and my one takeaway would be that if, for instance, you are creating something where the really the uniqueness of the experience comes from the interaction and the physical embodied thing that you ask uh, your audience to do in your experience, then you should show that in the video people engaging with and not just show uh, the visuals of the experience. Because that also uh, factors to the next phase, which is consideration.
And so consideration is the phase when after becoming aware, your audience, potential audience member starts to weigh in the different things that factor into the eventual decision to attend, participate, engage, uh, pay for your experience. And there, managing expectations and, and almost literally telling, for instance, the what is the degree of um, uh, expected interaction from the audience members is very important. Uh, also duty of care to sort of show that you will be onboarded to this uh, and taken care of during this experience is important to sort of lower the threshold of attendance, especially in certain cohorts. And this relates to a factor in research that is called the technology acceptance uh, level uh, or degree. So how comfortable are individual members of the audience to, for instance, put on a headset or put on or engage with a technology that they're not familiar with in their everyday sort of media and technology repertoire. And therefore, there's multiple things that go into uh, those considerations. And one way, uh, an aspect of that is obviously, for instance, the genre and the type of content that they're, they're communicating, what type of experience are you trying to make? So a choice, for instance, to acknowledge and try to capture and, and engage audience members from whom uh, uh, like a thrill seeking aspect, for example, is the, the whole thing that might just be the, your, your kind of lead in your communication and that just might work for you that it targets that certain niche that is seeking thrills from these kind of experiences and here you see a quote from uh, one producer wh whose company and studio have taken this very deliberate approach to uh, kind of facilitate that thrill seeking element. This also speaks to planning the audience journey the, the whole onboarding thing and duty of care thing so you can't expect just to, you know, put your production out there. It takes time and money and resourcing to have people there to help people, uh, the audience members, to go through that experience. And going forward, this is something that I feel is also underdeveloped on the digital side of things. So because we are definitely seeing uh, friction in adopting headsets and, and, and similar devices because people are just not comfortable of trying to engage with them on their own. So how could you facilitate that process? Whatever physical goods you might uh, actually be sending to people's home as part of your production, how do you make it as easy as possible for them to actually then uh, get on board? Also, I mentioned before the reframing of the technology so that you sort of draw, try to draw attention away from the technology itself and to the experience. That's another uh, element that you want, might, might want to do. Okay, let's move into the decision part. So this is along the journey, the, really the first moment of truth because of that <laughs> might uh, the decision for an audience member to attend or not to attend might contribute directly to your bottom line or general satisfaction and your your opportunity to continue the work for instance and therefore you need to be aware of the different dynamics that go into these decisions and of course for instance the size of a market that you are targeting is 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 one uh, important factor and unfortunately we don't really have much hard data uh, as of yet of, for instance, the UK market size, let's say in the location-based entertainment space. And of course, this is another thing that uh, is, is seriously now under uh, re-evaluation and, and under an uncertainty uh, because of the pandemic. But nevertheless, uh, this is something uh, that at Jesuva Catapult, we're trying to work towards to get more actual data of, to sort of manage uh, startups and immersive studios ex expectations of what are the sort of limits of audiences that they can hope to reach. And also then, uh, what is the willingness to pay? This is where my friends, I2Media, are uh, very capable of, of 
showing how uh, these things can be studied and evaluated. I've tried to summarize these things that factor into decision making into this uh, graph here, uh, illustration. Uh, and so it's very much about the, the kind of obvious things which have to do with price and location. Uh, a location can be also interpreted as platform. So do you have access to a platform? So if something, let's say, on AR, mobile AR is only available to Android or iOS or vice versa, then that, you know, shapes your audience. If it's uh, available for a cert only a certain kind of headset, that shapes your audience. Uh, and the price, of course, factors into that. But also then the more qualitative uh, characteristics and factors here are, I mentioned the technology acceptance in general, what can you expect? For a certain demographic, for instance, uh, in terms of putting on a headset or similar, then the social proof: uh, are their peers enjoying this? Is there a kind of positive FOMO, fear of missing out, uh, regarding this experience? That might be something that you want to deliberately build. Uh, but then all the other things: uh, the expected level of interaction, uh, the stories out there and research findings where, for instance, having to do with immersive theater, where the whole point of an immersive theater piece was to take it out from the theater to the streets and make it uh, a bit more chaotic, <laughs> if you will. But then uh, the some of the audience members complained because they didn't always see all the actors, they didn't uh, always know where to direct their attention. So that's an example where somebody with the mindset of a very traditional theater where you have a good view to the stage and, and all the techniques that have to do with lighting and, 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 and drawing audiences attention to the, on the stage to different things are kind of violated. Those expectations are violated and therefore the outcome is that they will leave uh, the piece dissatisfied and, and, and that will factor into their willingness to recommend, for instance. This is something that I'll come in the, in the final phase. So moving on to immersion. So this is the experience part in the most sort of traditional takes on the customer journey. Um, now, this is again um, an area where my Colleagues and friends at I2 Media Research uh, have developed a tool uh, which is an, an, which is very useful and quite sort of low cost, uh, high accessible entryway to start testing your um, productions already on a prototype phase and and therefore gain more audience insight and user understanding early on. Um, there is also a certain set of uh, design challenges that have to do especially with interactive pieces where here you see a quote from a producer where uh, the, the kind of creative goal has been to create an experience where uh, the design space is open in a way that uh, people are making choices on their own and therefore the, end, the, the best possible outcome would be that the audience members would come out of the experience feeling that it was really unique to themselves. But also just another more uh, research informed insight, uh, uh, which I've kind of alluded to a number of times before, how people bring their own personal context and habits and expectation to every experience. And they that will also shape how sort of fully will they interact with the piece. So if there's a lot of soft interaction, for instance, that is kind of the thing, how you get most out of the experience, then uh, there might be people who just are not familiar with those conventions of interaction through uh, their sort of familiarity with the technology and media. And therefore they might come out of the, ex come out of the experience by feeling that they didn't get um, as much as somebody else and and that's kind of like there's one uh, anecdote in the report how from a design creative point of view that might feel as a as a failure also what we are seeing is that user testing uh, 
tends to be one of those things that are uh, is a skill set and, and, and a set of know-how that is not necessarily in-house in small studios and therefore it tends to get like deprioritized in the production. So, they, so in the interviews uh, that we did for the research nobody discounted the need and potential usefulness of user research and testing but because they weren't well versed in the methodologies and, and, and so on and so forth, uh, what often tends to happen is that the production itself then take, takes over and uh, this might lead to the situation where uh, some ad hoc user tests are done very close to the end and that also means that their methodology might not be entirely sound, uh, which then might lead to skewed results uh, also because the cohort, the testing cohort, might not be representative of the target audience uh, and so on and so forth. So it's just another example for re where time and resource needs to be allocated um, early on to this and there needs to be somebody leading on this and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and we believe again that mapping the audience journey, not only from the user experience point of view, but from the stakeholder responsibility point of view is useful. And because we are what we are also seeing that in larger organizations, like for instance, the museums that are part of the digital experience demonstrator in the audience of the future program, uh, they have a culture of user research and our audience insights. So they have experts in house whose task it is to gather user insights from past projects, for instance, uh, to inform a new project and then advocate those insights along the journey. And they have a very good sort of set structure of where, uh, at which phases is uh, production tested and how that feeds into the process. And this is Definitely a resource issue, but also an issue where uh, if you come from the creative and artistic background, you don't necessarily just, you know, you're not aware of the possibilities and opportunities out there to do quite sort of low effort, low cost use testing uh, in different phases. So that's one of the uh, kind of outputs also from this research is to try to point uh, people working on productions to where to find uh, these relatively accessible uh, methodologies and tools. Also regarding user testing, uh, I think one very challenging part uh, with evaluation is if, how to assess if there's any longer term impact uh, out of your production. So for instance, if you have like many museums and heritage institutions have when they put something on display, uh, they define learning outcomes for the project. So uh, if it's a scientific exhibition, for instance, that they hope that, okay, people leave with a better a lasting understanding of the thing that was on display. And of course, immersive has huge potential, for instance, to make scientific concepts and abstract concepts more tangible, for instance. Uh, but actually evaluating whether that impact, that learning outcome, uh, causes any sort of behavioral change, for instance, is very challenging. So these kind of longitudinal studies or, or tracking of that behavior change is very challenging. Uh, so for instance, if you would create a production which is about climate change and you're trying to change people's behavior regarding their habits that contribute to the climate change, uh, then how do you prove that your piece actually managed to do that? It can be very challenging. And so there's no ready-made answers there. Uh, there are methodologies, but carrying them out, few, only few, uh, few parties have resources for that. And that therefore it tends to go towards academic research. And the challenge there is that then there's a turnover from academic research back into uh, uh, producers out there can be uh, time consuming. There might be just too much delay on, on that. Okay, let's go to the final part. 
So the final part uh, is another moment of truth, satisfaction and loyalty. So this is the post uh, experience part of the journey, but it's very important because especially if you your production is something that people can and, and you hope them to re-engage or recommend to others. So if you want to, for instance, create so-called organic growth, word of mouth, viral uh, buzz around your production, then you should think about how to facilitate that. So this is where community management, for instance, comes into the picture. So here you see a quote from a PR startup founder who have managed with their pro product create uh, a community ar ar around it uh, where people share stories about using the product and experiencing it and they try to leverage this by engaging the community and, and listening to them and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, But again this is one of those where somebody has to do that and in a small team allocating that responsibility can be challenging uh, but down the line uh, it does pay off in most cases. Another thing more having to do with revenue uh, regarding satisfaction and loyalty is uh, having to do with merchandising. So basically this is also something that has been tried and tested in the amusement park industry and there's research out there that we refer to where uh, providing possibility for the audience member to have like a, a reinforced memory imprint of your experience by buying a t-shirt, buying an object, uh, a piece of memorabilia that they take home and then might also contribute to that word of mouth thing. Uh, and the other benefit from thinking about and planning for merchandising is that then you also create another complementary revenue stream for your ticket or download uh, uh, revenues. So you're not as uh, depending on the pricing of the ticket, for instance. Uh, but again, uh, this is something that needs to plan for, this is something that needs to be executed, and uh, the more prepared you are when uh, the actual production launches, uh, the better you're in a much better place rather than doing this after the fact when you start seeing traction. So again, <laughs> I sound like a broken record, but the, the function of the audience journey approach and the templates, for instance, that we have as part of the report is to give uh, people tools, kind of like a structured mindset to think about these things uh, uh, in, in a more deliberate way. Okay. That's pretty much it. But there's one more thing. So in the report, uh, because we really think that uh, the output of this research, the main thing is this audience journey as an approach that can be applied in practice and can sort of inform your thinking about your production in a holistic manner. So therefore we have included templates uh, to the um, report and, and also they will be available uh, to download uh, as separate things that you can use uh, as printouts to think about things. So uh, both the audience journey template from the point of view of the responsibilities and stakeholders involved in different phases of the journey, but also another template which is about the user journey from an emotional perspective and how you can think in a more deliberate way of how to take your audience from being indifferent uh, or casually interested, let's say, to being excited and anticipating, waiting to see your production and then also possibly uh, eager to re-engage or uh, hear about what you're going to do next. So those templates will be part of the uh, report. So again, uh, I point you to go and uh, download the report but also, uh, also personally, I'm very happy to hear about uh, complementary angles, different angles to this research, and just uh, very interested in engaging and hearing uh, from practitioners out there if they have uh, found value uh, using this approach going forward. All right, thank you.